Hello, fellow members of the Midnight Society. Welcome back to another episode review from the show Are You Afraid of the Dark? Last time, we covered the tale of Prisoner's Past, a Tucker story about two stepbrothers who encounter a ghost at an old prison. Tonight's narrative, from Sam, is about a family that buys an old hotel to renovate it, but find more than they bargain for after discovering a dusty jukebox. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this Season 5, Episode 6, The Tale of C7. We open on Tucker and Stig arriving at the campfire. Tucker is freaking out and says he can't stand it, leading Kiki to say, Don't you ever change clothes? Don't you ever mind your own business? Ooh. What are you ooing? That wasn't a gotcha moment. He is literally always in the same outfit, and he was wringing out his socks over the fire in the last episode. The rest of you could stand to be asking a few more questions like Kiki. Look, I know we don't always see eye to eye, Kiki, but where Stig is concerned, I always have your back. Tucker says that he's upset because he was going to tell the group something, but it went out of his mind. Betty Ann says that if he stops trying to remember, he will remember. This leads to Sam giving her preamble. Her story is about memories, the kind that we all share. She then breaks out some trinkets and explains how all her stories are inspired by the items. Her grandmother's locket inspired the long ago locket, her brother's school ring inspired Dream Girl, etc. Now, look, the last two episodes, I've expressed my disappointment with how the stories seem to reuse stuff from other episodes, and this trip down memory lane is not instilling me with confidence for this one. Me neither. Sam says that a lot of memories are shared, and it's important because it brings people together as friends. She says, imagine if we didn't have those memories. It would be like we had no past and no friends. <laughs> Shows what you know. I got loads of memories and still have no friends. That is not the flex I thought it would be. And the future will be just as empty and lonely. Well, you don't have to get nasty about it. Sheesh. Anyway, her tale begins on Ellen and her two children, Jason and Lisa, played by real life siblings, arriving at an old hotel that Ellen just bought. Sam gives some voiceover saying that the kids were excited their mom quit her job to start her own business until they discovered what the business was. You dragged us a million miles from civilization and our friends for this? Yeah, the good part is that this is a very popular area. There is a bed and breakfast next door that people are just dying to stay at. Ellen tries to get the kids excited by showing them the lake and letting them know that this used to be a happening place called the Homestead Inn. She plans to make it a destination once again. Jason asks his sister if she thinks they can make it back to the city using an old boat on the docks. Ellen says no one is going anywhere in that, and then tells Lisa to stay off the docks until they can get her a life jacket. When Lisa protests, Ellen says, Hey, you're the one that didn't want swimming lessons. Also, I just realized that Jason looked familiar, and that's because we've seen him previously on Are You Afraid of the Dark in the tale of train magic. Hmm. Fatherless in both episodes, huh? I'm not saying it's suspicious, but I do think I need to keep an eye on this kid. I don't know. Ellen tries one more time to get her kids on board by saying, Just do it! Make your dreams come true! Oddly enough, that didn't seem to inspire them. Okay, before we go any further, let's analyze this family unit to figure out who we're dealing with here. The standard Are You Afraid of the Dark family has one or no parents, and typically one good kid and one dickweed. We haven't seen a father, which means single parent household. Do we think divorced or dead? Mm. Look, no one has dead dad energy, so I'm gonna go with divorced. Now, which kid is which? Initial impressions make it seem like Jason is the spicy one, so I'm guessing Lisa is the good kid. Fortunately, I don't have to wait long to find out since the family is about to reenact the moving in scene from the tale of the dark music. Very funny. Ah, oh, it's stuck. It's weird, it's not locked. So then, why won't it open? Whoa! What'd you say about this place just needing a coat of paint and some elbow grease? Huh. I mean, Jason is a bit of a negative Nancy, but so far neither kid appears to be a member of the Canadian Royal Douchery. And the mother's been really present in this episode. I mean, this seems like a nice family. What the f are you afraid of the dark? You're blowing it, man! You're breaking your own rules! Later that night, Jason is awoken by a muffled sound that seems to be coming from outside.
Fortunately, using modern technology, I was able to clean up that audio so we could hear what was being said. Let's watch the scene again with the enhanced audio. Damn it, kid. Stop injecting yourself into other ghost stories. If this kid loses his jacket one more time, I'll kill him. I mean, he's already dead, so I can't. Wait, can a ghost kill another ghost? Because if so, I'll kill me so my ghost can kill him. Yeah, it's perfect. Jason wanders out of his room to find out what the sound is, and we get a classic Are You Afraid of the Dark non-scary jump scare. Jason asks his mom if she heard the music. She doesn't know what he's talking about, but they both go downstairs to investigate and find Lisa just staring like she's Carol Ann looking at the TV in Poltergeist. Jason gets Lisa's attention and she asks if they can hear the music. She then goes back to staring and we can see what she's looking at. Okay, her looking at the lake in an almost trance-like state after her mom already mentioned she can't swim? <laughs> it's not foreboding at all. The next day, they get the sealed door open and we find out that Jason is clearly a psychopath. There's a bunch of nothing back here. What kind of monster puts their hand in a spider web and doesn't even so much as flinch? I'm doubling down on what I said earlier. I definitely need to keep an eye on this pre-adolescent Norman Bates here. I know this. Inside the room, they find an old jukebox. Jason plugs it in and pushes A2 to see if it works. It starts playing a song, and Jason uses the opportunity to throw shade at his mom. Must bring back a lot of memories, huh, mom? Yo, yo, yo. Your mama's so fat, I had to look three times just to see Oliver. Yo, hit him back, man. Oh, yeah? Well, your mama's so old, she listened to old jukebox songs growing up. Yeah. What, what did he just say? Uh, no, he did not. Dude, you didn't have to get personal. Uncool, brah. As the song plays, something is moving from the lake towards the inn, but before it can get there, this happens. While Ellen starts to freak out, wondering if the building is going to need new wiring, Jason seems infatuated by the jukebox. He says that if they could get more old stuff like that, they could give the place a retro feel that might be kind of cool. Ellen is shocked to hear something positive and hands Jason a toolbox. She and Lisa then leave to let Jason tinker with the old music player. I'm sorry, you were just worried about a potential wiring issue, so you Give your teenage son with no electrical engineering or repair experience that we know of some tools and tell him to have a ball? Are you trying to get him killed or burn the place down? It, it, and for legal reasons, I should say, you probably shouldn't answer that question. It's all so tragic. Later, in what might be the most unbelievable part of the episode, Jason has opened up and repaired the jukebox. He then tries to play the title of the tale, C7, a track labeled Last Dance, but it won't play. He then tries B5 and gets a bingo. Or sinks a battleship. You pick. What the hell were you jumping at? It wasn't Freddy Krueger or the pool monster from Dead Man's Float outside the window. It was an attractive teenage girl. Let me get this straight. Spider webs, no f***ing reaction whatsoever. But a pretty girl makes you pee yourself? Ought to be 12 again. Jason goes outside to investigate what he saw, but we just get another lame jump scare. No one else saw the girl outside, and so they don't believe Jason, with the mom asking if he's getting strange on her. <laughs> Please, getting strange? Uh, that train has definitely left the station, if you know what I mean. That night, Jason is awoken by the sound of the jukebox playing. When he goes to check it out, this happens. Come on, man! She wanted to touch fingers, E.T. style, and you ruined it! Anyway, the next day, he tries telling his mom about it, but again, she doesn't believe him, claiming that he might have been sleepwalking. She doesn't want to hear any more talk about the place being haunted, but as she says this, Lisa walks up and only hears one word out of the entire sentence. Haunted? No, honey, we don't believe in ghosts. Nothing like country living, huh, Lisa? Wait, you're sending your son up an unsecured ladder to wash upstairs windows, and you're not even sticking around to supervise? She really is trying to kill this kid. 
I'm starting to think I misjudged this family. They are not the friendly bunch I thought they were. After Ellen walks off, Lisa starts staring at the lake like she's possessed again, and then... Oh no. Jason grabs the rope to the boat and manages to pull Lisa back in, all while she delivers some more information on our, dare I say it, dream girl. She said he promised to dance to it again, no matter what, and then she started to cry. The mom discovers the kids on the dock before Jason can get the boat out of the water. She is extremely unhappy, telling Lisa that she never wants her by the water alone, and telling Jason... And I want you to keep a closer eye on her while I am gone. Um... You sent him up a ladder and f***ed off to do God knows what. You are the last person who gets to be treating anyone else like they're irresponsible. Jason tries telling his mom that his sister saw a ghost. She doesn't want to listen to it, but Jason insists that something weird is going on. So, Ellen finally comes clean about the inn. The only reason that I was able to afford this place was because of the stories. I knew it. Reality check. There are no such things as ghosts. Look. I get that adults aren't supposed to believe in ghosts, but both your kids started seeing ghosts at the Haunted Inn before either of them ever heard the story about the place. You didn't find that the least bit peculiar? What am I saying? <laughs> of course she didn't. She's gonna kill Jason via accident and blame it on the ghost. It's the perfect crime! Isn't it just heaven? Ellen tells Jason the story about the inn. Apparently, just after World War II, a welcome home party was planned there for a boy who had been shipped off to war. On the night of the party, a telegram was received that he was killed. The same night, there was also a storm that took the life of the boy's girlfriend, who was coming across the lake to the party in a canoe. Jason thinks the girl in the canoe is who his sister saw, but his mom doesn't believe in ghosts, and heads off to a meeting saying that she'll be back in a couple of hours. That night, Jason is messing around with the jukebox, while Lisa is reading the same edition of the Ghastly Grinner comic that Ethan was given in his tale, proving that the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe got the idea from these Campfire Story crossovers, and there is no other explanation. Who? What are you talking about? Jason tries playing C7 again, but it won't work. He opens the jukebox up to fix it, and Lisa gets that I'm about to be compelled to do something stupid look in her eyes. By the time Jason realizes Lisa has left the room, she has taken the boat and gone far enough out on the lake that she's not even visible at all. Jason calls the police, but rather than just say his sister who can't swim took their boat onto the lake and has disappeared, he goes with... My sister's out on the lake. I think she's trying to find this ghost of a woman in a canoe. No, this isn't a prank. Wait! Oh? Okay, okay, why don't you think about what you said, call them back, and try again. Even if you continue to say dumb things, they'll eventually send a black and white to pick you up for making the prank phone calls, and you'll have a chance to show them your sister's missing. Or worst case scenario, they send the phone police instead of the regular police. Have pizza and jumbo extra cheese all dressed whole the anchovies. On second thought, better not risk it. We have got to stop scaring each other like this. Jason hears a noise inside and goes to investigate. He sees the jukebox close by itself. Since he doesn't actually see the pretty girl in the room, he feels brave and presses C7 on the machine, resulting in an acid trip question mark Jason finds himself at the welcome home party from the ghost story only this time the soldier makes it home from war his name is Tommy and he immediately starts asking where his girlfriend Iris is the crowd gets very somber and just when it seems like hope is lost she arrives excuse me buddy now that is the confidence of a ghost who's about to get laid. Your boss can't wait. Tommy and Iris joyfully embrace and dance their last dance while Jason looks on with a contented smile. But, you know, it sucks that your sister's still missing. Jason, buddy, sister, can't swim, out on the lake. Yeah, you're right, sisters are overrated anyway. At the conclusion of the song, Iris thanks Jason and the two ghosts leave, bringing Jason back to reality or whatever, where I'm sure he urgently starts looking for his sister again. Mom! What? But they were... What? Lisa. Okay, I mean, it took him a while, but he got there. Jason and his mom head out to the dock to see the empty boat floating by it. They both begin to call out for Lisa in a panic, and then she just suddenly appears and says... 
She told me everything was all right. And then she brought me back. But why did she call you out there to begin with? Okay, let's get into this ghost story because they really seem to struggle with those making sense on this show. Iris must have been the ghost that haunted the inn, if you can call what she did haunting, and all it took to free her spirit was to get the jukebox to play C7. You're telling me that no one in the history of this place was able to fix this machine, but a 12-year-old who'd probably never actually interacted with a jukebox before was able to do it with little effort? <laughs> and, and why did the sister get called out onto the water? I mean, it seemed to have no bearing on anything other than to force in some tension. I mean, maybe the intent was that the sister allowed the ghost to make it to the party, but the ghost had been to the inn multiple times prior, and the ghost brought her back in the end. There also wasn't any consistency with the ghostly music. At first, it came from the lake, or seemed to, but then it came from the jukebox, and then possibly from the lake again? Maybe not. Lastly, the welcome home party was visually a bit confusing. I took it to be a ghostly reunion happening in the present, but the appearance of all the guests and the physical changes in the room could make it seem like Jason was in or viewing the past, and that could lead to confusion about why Tommy was home if he supposedly died. I think the scene would have played more clearly if there had been no one else there. Just Tommy walking through the door, you know, in the normal looking inn, and he's looking for Iris, only finding Jason. He thinks that she didn't wait for him, and he's sad until she walks through the door, and then the scene can play out just as it did. Anyway, sorry for the tangent. I have to talk about these things when they bother me. Uh, the episode ends with... Hey, I got a great idea for this main room. We can make it like a cafe or a bar. Um, Jason, buddy, your mom thought your sister had drowned a few moments ago, and while she doesn't care about your safety, she does care about your sister, so maybe now isn't the time to pitch your design ideas. Don't even say it. Back at the Midnight Society, Sam says that no one ever saw a ghost at the Homestead Inn again, but that Jason would always remember the ghosts and the song that brought them together. Jason could never get C7 to play again. Oh, I see. He was only mechanically gifted when it was convenient for the story. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Anyway, the episode ends with Tucker remembering what he wanted to tell everyone with a little help from Mother Nature. That's it! What's it? The thing I couldn't remember. I heard there's a big storm coming tonight. Well. Good thing no one's parents check the weather or care enough about their kids to keep them at home on a potentially stormy night. <laughs> Actually, this is Are You Afraid of the Dark? That, that tracks. Yeah, that tracks. That's important. Now for the review. Well, this was the third episode in a row to feel like a mashup of previous episodes, so I was not a fan. It's not like I hate it, though, or anything. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm just indifferent to it, and... I mean, that might be worse than me hating it. I mean, at least if I hate an episode, I'll think about it from time to time. This one will leave my memory soon after I finish making this video, which I think is ironic since the story was supposed to be about memories, even though memories really didn't factor into it at all. But don't get me started on that. You haven't seen the good part yet. The settings were boring. The lake wasn't really used at all, which feels like a waste of the location. The inn could have been cool if it looked like the hotel that time forgot on the inside, and. You know, that could have lent itself to some creepy atmosphere if they were going for scares, which I guess they weren't. Hey, don't look at me. The story. What this story desperately needed was either more time with Iris or more exposition about the ghost story. Because when the ending rolled around, I couldn't have cared less about the reunion because I didn't know the characters. Iris appears twice before the end, and both times are extremely brief. It would have been nice if we had seen Lisa's interactions with Iris. I mean, you know, that would have given us a chance to get to know her a bit, while also making us understand why the hell Lisa f***ed off to the lake to warn a ghost about a storm that happened 50 years ago. If there had been a storm in the present mirroring the events from the past, that would have been something, but we didn't get that. This story felt like the tale of the dream girl and the tale of the dark music had a very uninteresting love child. Which sucks, because those are both great episodes. Did I hear something positive for a change? The Scares. Another scareless episode. There were a couple of false jump scares, but I mean, they didn't amount to anything. I get that we're telling a love story, but it's a ghost love story, and children are generally afraid of ghosts. It's the same as my issue with the previous episode. Iris, just like One-Eyed Jack, is not evil or malevolent. They just need help moving on. But as a ghost, 
They are meant to be perceived as a scary, malicious thing until we find out their motivation. There were plenty of opportunities for Iris to be perceived as a threat leading up to the Happy Ghost reunion, but we never go there. Younger me wouldn't have found this one scary, but it might have made me think I could mess around with electrical wiring on a professional level. You're dreaming. The acting in this episode was good. I fully bought Jason and Lisa as siblings, which I guess isn't really that impressive since they are siblings. Um, but Jason was a solid lead, reacting emotionally appropriately to all the situations he finds himself in. Lisa wasn't given much to do, but I mean, she was great at the far off, I'm listening to a ghost serenade me looks. Iris and Tommy are hard to judge since they're barely in the episode, but they convincingly portray a young couple in love. That's sort of what my story is about. The adult acting in the episode was great. Ellen was given a lot more screen time than most Are You Afraid of the Dark parents, and she makes the most of it. You believed her relationship with the kids, and the panic on her face near the end when she thinks Lisa might be dead was intense and realistic. Lisa! Sam, unfortunately, the tale of C7 does not meet the approval of the Midnight Society. The Midnight Society members poll on this one was, at the time of recording this video, 87% in favor of, with 13% against, so I'm being overruled. Oh sure, just because you all have memories and friends. And that's my point. Thank you to my patrons financially supporting the channel on Patreon. Jimmy Purcell, Rick Maxwell, Sean Hart, Jay Booth, Tony Ebers, Jessica Tim, EC, J.R. Green, Emilio Flores, and AJ Nowacki. I'll be saving you all one last dance. If you want early access to videos as well as bonus behind the scenes content, you can join my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Check it out at patreon.com forward slash jack of all nerds. Oh, I think it's great. I want to thank the following Midnight Society members for participating in this video's poll. I hope this is what you want. think of Sam's story? Did you see it as a kid? Would you send your child up a tall ladder and then f off to let nature take its course? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to check out the next episode on the Tale of Badge. Until then, are you afraid of the dark? Let's bring back a lot of memories, huh, Mom? Thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a share. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when more of these episodes go up and we'll see you all next time.